All right. I want to ask all of you a very simple question today. You ready? What would the world look like if every child in Americas or Africa, in Asia, Europe, Australia, even Antarctica, could go to school every single day? Think about it. A world made true and, and real due to the possibilities of technology and connectedness. A world where right to education wasn't just a promise, but a reality. What would such a world look like? Would uh, every single country become developed? Perhaps are um, more livable, maybe more peaceful? Give me a second. Does this have a calculator? I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to read your minds and calculate what you're thinking right now. So you need to open up a little bit. Okay. Um, it seems like, um, seems like we have an answer. And I think most of you agree. Um, but I see some skeptics. Just like many of you here, I would love this dream to come true. But I'm not entirely sure that it would make the world a better place or a much better place. But to understand why, or to start asking the right questions, we need to understand what it means to be developed. Does having more income per person uh, make a country more developed, or perhaps less inequality in the distribution of money? Maybe. Nobel laureate Amartya Sen argues that development happens when people have freedom or choices of opportunities in life when they can exercise the freedom to do what they want, when they have additional capabilities in life. Really, in simple words, uh, what, what Amartya Sen is saying, that, people, that countries are developed when all people, not just a few, all people are happier, are more empowered, and have a better well-being. When they have the license to their own life's outcomes. And it is this that gets us thinking about what, what actually, what does develop mean? What actually gets people excited? Now, now, the truth is money can't get you happiness. Even though happiness is an end means uh, for, for development, money can't buy you happiness. Um, but feeling empowered can, and empowerment can. As it turns out, empowerment is directly related to feeling happy because one is happier when they can have relationships with people around them, when they can reflect on where they are and what they need to do to be where they want to be, and when they are physically and emotionally at peace. Would you agree? Great, so if this is the case, uh, and it makes so much sense, why don't, why aren't we all groomed and grown uh, to, be, to be happier? And more specifically, why isn't, why isn't our education uh, kind of focused on making us more empowered? I mean, sure, learning math and sciences and social studies are excellent for professional pursuits and um, rational decision-making and thinking. But the 21st century demands true empowerment for local and global challenges, not ones whose answers sit in textbooks or teachers' answer sheets. Well, very unfortunately, K-12 education systems today are far from this reality. Most of them are built on the residues of the Industrial Revolution. And we all, you and me, happen to be clogs in this machinery trying to maximize the wealth of nations. You see, our education systems today have a very narrow focus, particularly in the developing countries, one of producing better college-ready students and better workforces. And that is far from the local realities of our society and the future needs of tomorrow. And this is stifling the growth of human beings. A cartoonist illustrated it best. If Socrates was alive today and came down to earth, this is probably what would happen. But let's get out the hypothetical. Let's take, for example, Farhan, a high school student in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Today, in his math class, Farhan is going to learn about how to solve calculus problems. But ask him how it's got anything to do with real life, and he has no idea. Because all he cares about is how to score that extra grade in his exams. In his social studies class, Farhan makes the finest, trust me, the finest notes on the United Nations and the birth of the League, League of Nations. But feels powerless and clueless when he witnesses racism amongst his neighborhood kids because he doesn't know how to resolve conflicts. Heck, all he cares about is the date of organization's formations. 
In his science class, Farhan learns about chemical bonds in his one-seater desk, but will most likely struggle to maintain human bonds several years ago uh, later in his, in his first job because the rules of competition and assessment never taught him how to collaborate or work with other people in teams. You see, people learn socially, not alone. And perhaps, perhaps his high scores will put him on a path to climb up the ladder and get on the Bangladeshi equivalent of the American dream. But his lack of social skills, his lack of moral values, his lack of his understanding of in, his, in his role as a member of the society, will make him forget his responsibilities and individual being. Now, if this isn't bad enough, here's what makes it really worse. The world Farhan is going to inherit from the future generations demands that Farhan have the answer to some of the most pressing questions he will face, the world will face, HIV, AIDS, global warming, the Palestinian and Israeli conflict, rampant corruption, gender inequality. But Farhan doesn't have the answers to these questions. Farhan hasn't been prepared to answer these questions. What if I told you that this isn't just true of Farhan in Bangladesh or Tosob in Kenya, but with Hiroto in Japan and Susan in California? It's true. And it is this approach to education which is leaving us far from developing as a humanity. So enough of a pain talk, but I became really passionate about this problem. I really wanted to change it. And in 2012, that I realized that what we taught our kids in classrooms needed to change. Curriculum needed to change. And it needed to change from being top down to being one that was truly democratic. You see, until today, curriculum decision making was something that happened in closed rooms by policymakers on a national state and sometimes on a school district level. But to make it truly reflect the local realities of today, of your society, of your community, and the needs of tomorrow, you need to participate in it. It had to bring together representation from all entities, public and private, parents and children, advocacy groups, most importantly, teachers. Because that open and collective decision-making will help us make better decisions about the growth of our children, about how to achieve happiness. And this passion and determination made me ask a lot of questions. Now, on a side note, growing up, um, I became a big fanatic of um, the, the open source movement in technology. And most importantly, I was fascinated by the fact that it illustrated how groups of connected people from all over the world could come together um, and change a highly regulated and monopolized industry. As it turns out, the state of education is very, very similar. And that made me launch Open Curriculum, an online platform where communities from around the world come together to produce better curriculum for their own communities. Today, Open Curriculum is a nonprofit technology startup in California, and our technologies allow departments inside schools, schools inside districts, and districts inside cities to produce better curriculum engaging their community. And it's really simple, just anybody, anybody can go in with their community and produce better curriculum in a subject or skill area that they want to bring change in and produce lesson plans and syllabus right there. Since 2013, we've been really lucky and fortunate to work with some excellent groups who are two steps ahead of us in, in producing a more innovative curriculum. Take, for example, this NGO in India, Hippocampus which is providing better reading and literacy opportunities to really affordable schools in India. They work with hundreds of schools and the poorest of children to uplift learning access. Using open curriculum, they're not just able to find better curricular content, but also instantly able to engage all their librarians across schools to discuss better outside the class reading activities. Or consider Stu Voice, a US nationwide student network which is involving students in better decision-making in K-12 opportunities and challenges around the country. Using open curriculum, Stu Voice students are able to engage in discussions about what textbooks and resources they prefer for problem and project-based learning. Just like these two organizations, several communities from around the world are participating in deciding what they want their communities to learn, what they want their children to learn for better citizenship. This never used to happen before. This brings me to my last point. 
until today, we have, we've focused on giving people what they need in a very imperialistic sense, in a, in a giving sense, when we don't know their needs. And, and our work demonstrates that we don't actually have the answers to everything. We don't impose our philosophies on education on any group, on, on what, what is needed to make local individuals better and smarter and healthier and happier. We realize that curriculum is different. It's different everywhere. It's highly local and highly contextual. Two schools within the same city and two cities within the same state have different needs. Heck, two kids within the same classroom have different needs because of their cultural and educational backgrounds. So we need to begin by humbly admitting that we don't have the answers and there is no one-size-fits-all. There is no magic tablet. There is no broadband solution. But the lesson here is that we need to build bridges, not theme parks. And that if we provide what we call social capital to highly intentioned people from around the world to do things that were previously considered the responsibilities of the governments, we can move millions of people forward much better than we are today. And it all begins with the cornerstone of human development, education. You see, we're far from achieving our mission of complete openness and innovation in K-12 education around the world. But we know we've done something. We've ignited a fire. We've ignited a fire of not accepting the status quo of today's sale curriculum. And you shouldn't either. And so I ask you, no, actually, I demand, I demand that you participate in deciding what your kids learn, what Farhan learns. Because you have the power to change it. Raise your hand, ask the right questions, and change it. Change it because you don't want your kids. Oh, I see a lot of students here. You don't want your siblings. Um, you don't want your siblings to grow up to be people who are great at memorizing facts or live lives in isolation like several of us are living. Change it because you, you want your kids and you want your siblings to be creative like Da Vinci, empathetic uh, like uh, Oprah, have leadership like Ford, responsibility like Gandhi, and curiosity like Newton. Because I believe that every child, every single child has that potential. And if we work together and we help bring that potential to life, happiness will be at the corner in the world of our dreams. Thank you so much.